he finally had the chance to make the big sale. He was in the final interview of the largest contract he had ever put together. And everything was going wonderful in the interview. Everything was going great in the interview. He was sure that they were going to go with his bid. There was nothing preventing this from happening. Everything was going great. Then the executive's assistant came in and said that she was needed just for, just for a minute or two, something real quick, and, and apologized. She got up, apologized, said, I'm sorry, but I'll be, I'll be right back. So the sales rep, uh, the sales rep sat there and looking around at her beautifully appointed office and was looking at her family pictures there. And, and then his eyes wandered to her desk and he saw, he saw another contract lying out on the desk. She had been studying another bid, a bid from his competitor. So leaning forward a little bit, he saw all the, all the figures in the column going down the page, and he was kind of looking, but the bottom line was covered by a, a pop can that she had sitting there. So he was tempted just to move the pop can and see the bottom line of his competitor's bid, which would obviously be very helpful for him. I mean, what harm could really come from, like, reading her private information, right? Right? I mean, after all, she had left it out in plain sight. Kind of. So after wrestling with himself for a little while, he finally decided he was just going to look. So as he lifted up the pop can, he discovered that it wasn't filled with pop at all. But actually it was a bottomless can filled with thousands of BBs that went gushing out and running all over her desk and cascading down onto the carpet. So his attempt to uh, undercut the competition had been exposed. Not every temptation is so obvious. Not every failure is so embarrassing. But every temptation is a challenge. You and I are surrounded by, we're surrounded by temptations. Um, dollar menus at fast food places tempt us to, to binge out on cheap, fatty, overly processed foods. Amazon Prime tempts us to buy whatever we want, whenever we want it. Netflix ten, uh, tempts us to, to, to just keep binging on movies and shows. The beauty of the internet contains everything. The curse of the internet contains everything. The click of a button can bring us all kinds of information that is helpful. Click of a button can also bring us all kinds of garbage and gossip and pornography and violence and hate. Clickbait, clickbait tempts us to go places that we wouldn't go. Um, the social media rabbit hole provides endless temptations for us. phones. Our, 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 your, our phones keep us in touch uh, with, with people no matter where we go. But our phones also tempt us to never be anywhere but on the phone. A, a, a first car, first car provides freedom, um, responsibility, possibility. But a first car can also be, can also tempt a young driver to go places they shouldn't go, to drive too fast, to show off. Um, the wealth surrounding us, all the wealth surrounding us can tempt us to, to figure out shortcuts, how we can get more of it for ourselves. Or just how about, think about some of the temptations to, to glory and gloat over the failures of others, right? Our, our temptation, our indulgence in this temptation keeps paparazzi employed, right? Um, Mugshots of celebrity drunk drivers fill the news as if that were real news. We watch reality shows. We watch uh, crime shows. We watch reality crime shows as if watching the failures and the sins of others somehow helps absolve us of our own. Social media gives endless platforms for us to glory and gloat over the failures and sins of others. The Bible says um, in the book of James... The Bible says that temptation carries you, and, and it entices you. 
I mean, a simple, a simple flirtatious text can lead to all kinds of pain and hardship. A, a tough marriage can, can make a good man look twice at the wrong woman. An extended, excruciating illness can, can tempt even the strongest soul to contemplate suicide. Um, the stress can make this, the smokiest nightclub smell sweet. The wilderness of difficulty can tempt you to give thought to the unthinkable. So Jesus was in the wilderness. Jesus was in the wilderness um, being tempted by the tempter. We, we read the text earlier where the devil came. We, we heard the three temptations the devil gave him. They could have been many. Um, those are the three that are recorded during that 40-day time. So the temptations that Jesus threw at, sorry, the temptations that Satan threw at Jesus during his 40-day fast weren't just challenges tempting Jesus to do something that he wasn't supposed to do. They were challenges tempting Jesus to be somebody that he wasn't supposed to be. The ultimate temptations in life aren't the ones pushing you to to do something you shouldn't do. They're the ones pushing you to be someone that you weren't made to be. That's our first point. The ultimate temptations aren't the ones, uh, the ultimate temptations isn't to do something you shouldn't do. It's, it's to be something you aren't. The devil wasn't just tempting Jesus to take the edge off his hunger by turning stones into bread. He was tempting the Son of God to replace his table relationship with his father for fast food, literally, fast food. If Jesus would have given in to this temptation, he would not have been trusting in his father's loving providence. The devil wasn't just tempting Jesus to jump off the temple roof. He was tempting the Son of God to demand action from the father based on the son's interests and desires. So you believe that your father will care for you and prolong your life? Then make him prove it. Let your relationship be based on proof. The devil wasn't just tempting Jesus to, with, with all the power and prestige of the earthly kingdoms. He was tempting the Son of God to intentionally orphan himself from the Father by choosing a, an easier, shortcut way to becoming the king. One that wouldn't have worked anyway. The devil failed. The devil failed not because Jesus refused to do the things offered. The devil failed because Jesus refused to be anyone other than who he is. Himself, the Son of God. But here we are today, and you and I are still facing temptations from the tempter. It's a present word there, an active word given his name. He is the one who is still tempting us. So you and I still face temptations from this tempter who Jesus defeated today. Wouldn't it be better if the devil wasn't around to tempt us and make our life so miserable and cause so much pain in our lives? Wouldn't it be better if Jesus would have just killed him? If Jesus would have just destroyed him, just blown him up like in the movies? You know, like the guy does in the movies, the hero guy. So that we never would have been surrounded by temptations again, so that we'd never have to face temptations again. Isn't that the Jesus we want? But what Jesus did instead is what we needed. He did something that we couldn't do, that we didn't do. Withstand temptation. Someone had to do that for us so we could be perfect. Someone had to do it right. Someone had to undergo and do that. And he did what he did for us is actually what we needed. So our second point, we may want the devil dead, but what we need is perfection. The devil just being dead wouldn't have done what we needed to have done. We needed someone to perfectly withstand that temptation. But sometimes, you know, is... is Instead of the Jesus we need, we, we kind of long for the Jesus we want. Have you ever questioned uh, Jesus' priorities? <laughs> I mean, if he stilled storms, if he healed the sick, if he raised the dead, then 
why hasn't he just kind of put an end to like earthquakes and hurricanes and pandemics? Um, why doesn't he just take out evil madmen so we wouldn't have unnecessary wars? Why doesn't Jesus do the kind of stuff that would just once and for all silence the skeptics and silence the doubters where you couldn't even argue with whether Jesus is the truth or not? Because Satan, this is what Satan was giving Jesus opportunities to do, this kind of stuff. Satan gave Jesus these opportunities during their showdown. He was tempting the Son of God to change the rules and achieve his goals with some kind of a dazzling shortcut method. He was tempting Jesus to wear the crown, but not the cross. This temptation, which Jesus resisted, many of us still long for, right? We long for not the cross. We long for the easier way out, the shortcut way out, the simpler, the the better way, the easier way. And, And here, in a sense, Satan was offering Jesus the chance to be the Savior that we think we wanted. Oh, did you see him jump off that temple roof? Right? You see, like, he, that guy can make bread out of stones. Let's go. He gave Jesus the opportunity to be the kind of Savior that I think a lot of people in the world think that they want. We don't want a suffering Messiah. Peter didn't want a suffering Messiah, right? When Jesus started telling his disciples that he was going to suffer and die, Peter's like, no, I'll never let that happen to you, ever. And what did Jesus call him? Away from me, Satan. We don't want a suffering Messiah. Uh, the, the criminal on the, the cross didn't. Aren't you the Christ? Save yourself and us. And the spectators joined him and jeered, let him come down from the cross. Then we will believe in him. Okay, if he does that kind of stuff, then we'll believe in him. Let him jump off the temple and not splat on the bottom. Then we will believe with him. But there was no easy way. There was no painless path. For Jesus to save others, he couldn't save himself. For Jesus to save others, he couldn't save himself. And he knew that. He knew that when he faced Satan in the desert. But do do we want him to be different sometimes? Do do we want him to be different? To impress me with signs, with some kind of signs that, um, that, that would give me like no reason to ever doubt. That would just, signs I couldn't deny. And so I'd never have doubts in him again. Or maybe, um, maybe we want him to use, to use force to make things happen, right? Like, we, that's how we think of power, right? Power comes in how much force you can use to make something happen. You know, who, you know who uses power that way? The enemy uses power that way. But maybe sometimes we want Jesus just to force things to happen when that's not how he operates. Maybe we want him to take a more active role in in human affairs as well. Like, I mean, if God would just flick a certain Russian dictator off a throne, um, wouldn't a lot of lives be saved right now? Or maybe, maybe God could just answer my prayers more quickly. And maybe God could just answer my prayers the way that I want him to answer my prayers. Or maybe, maybe God could just perform some impressive thing, something so impressive that when my friends come at me with their doubts and their skepticism, I can just point them to that. Like, how can you argue with that? Maybe God could just do something just more impressive than, you know, than the words here. But what do we hear Jesus say? What do we hear Jesus talking like? Jesus says stuff like this. Oh, Jerusalem, how I've longed to gather you together. How I've longed to gather you. But you were not willing. See, his disciples, Jesus' disciples had proposed that he call down fire on those unrepentant cities. But Jesus, Jesus let his heart break for those who don't trust in him. Jesus never forces himself on people who aren't willing. Jesus' power is shown in restraint. Okay, it wasn't, about, it wasn't about what he could do. It was about what he wouldn't do, even though it would have helped himself. It was about what he wouldn't do for our sake. That is how love is. 
So you have this powerful king, this powerful king who went, went face to face with evil with the power to destroy it, but he chose a different path. He chose a different path, a different way. Also, here's, here's just our third point is, is a really, um, is, it's, it's really helpful that he's the Jesus we need, not the Jesus we want. Jesus didn't fight with something we can't fight with. Okay, when, when we see Jesus going up against the devil, Jesus doesn't fight with some divine power. He fights with the same armor of God that we all have, the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God. And that is why it's a good thing that Jesus is who we need and not who we want. If, if, if Jesus was like we want, he just, you know, like blew up the devil with some, you know, divine fireball, then what would we have to fight against the devil with? But Jesus didn't win in a way that we couldn't also win with. Jesus won by using the same thing that we can use when we face temptations, the Word of God. When the devil came at Jesus, what did he say? He said, it is written. You're putting this thing in front of me. You're tempting me to veer from God. You're trying to draw me away from who God has made me to be. It is written. And this never changes. Jesus used the word of God, the same thing we have, and he showed us how. So that when we live our lives now, because Jesus is the Savior that we need and not the Savior we want, we have this powerful tool when the devil comes after us in the warfare we fight every day, and we get to say, it is written. Because he can't argue against this. He can't, his power is not as powerful as this word is. And so we have that power with us. The word of God, where God has written what is true. And so we have the same tool that to fight against temptation as Jesus used because he's the Savior we need. And when temptation comes our way, we get, to, we get to point to the word of God and say it is written. Because without that, you and I, we're, in, we're vulnerable to temptation, okay? We lack the willpower to, uh, to resist uh, shortcut solutions to human needs. We lack the patience to allow God to work in his slow, gentle way. And we sometimes, we just want to take control and, and force something to happen by compelling people to accomplish our goals our way. And we, friends, my friends, we, we trade a lot. We often trade, are willing to trade a lot away for the chance to realize our ambitions. So it's a good thing that Jesus is the Savior we need instead of the one we wanted. Because his willingness to undergo and resist temptations gave us freedom. In Hebrews, it says, We do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet did not sin. Because he himself suffered when he was tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. Jesus was led by the Spirit in the wilderness to be tempted. Okay, going was his idea. Satan didn't drag him. The Holy Spirit led him. This is part of the plan. This is part of God's plan. This is part of the mission that he came here to do. This was a rematch. For the second time in human history, an, an unfallen soul will be challenged by a, a fallen angel. The second Adam came to succeed where the first Adam had failed. But this time is going to be harder. Adam, Adam was... Uh, Adam was tested in a garden. Jesus was, temp Jesus was tested in, in the desert. Adam uh, faced Satan on a full stomach. Jesus was in the middle of a fast. Adam had a companion, Eve. Jesus had no one. Adam was challenged to remain sinless in a sinless world. Jesus was challenged to remain sinless in a sin-ridden world. So Jesus succeeded where Adam failed. Jesus succeeded where we fail. And that's why this victory, this victory is a huge victory for all of us. That's what our Romans passage was talking about. Consequently, just as one trespass resulted in condemnation for all people, so also one righteous act resulted in justification, that's being declared not guilty, 
and life for all people. So Jesus just killing the devil wouldn't do it. He had to withstand temptation. He had to withstand temptation for us so that we could get the credit for withstanding temptation, so we could get the credit for righteousness and perfection. And so our final point is that his obedience brought us righteousness. Jesus is our stand-in. Jesus did for us what a guy named Bobby did for a guy named David in boot camp. Okay, David was likable. Everyone liked David, but David was really weak and out of shape. David had the desire, but not the strength. Okay, no way he was going to pass the fitness test. He was too weak for the pull-ups. But Bobby really wanted to help David out. So Bobby put on David's T-shirt. And that shirt had David's last name on it and his service serial number on the back. See, the superiors didn't really recognize faces yet. They just read names and numbers off shirts and recorded scores. So Bobby did David's pull-ups. And David passed with flying colors. David came out looking real good, but he never broke a sweat. And neither did we. We were no match for Satan. Jesus knows this. And so Jesus put on our T-shirt. Jesus put on our flesh. He was tempted in every way just as we are, yet he did not sin. And because he was tempted and withstood it, we get credit for withstanding it. You and I, we pass with flying colors. We look perfect to God. So he isn't the Jesus we need. He isn't the Jesus we want. Scratch that. You know what I mean. He isn't the Jesus we want. He's the Jesus we need. Amen.